like science fiction. I don't know how about you guys, but I love sci-fi. And what it taught me in the past 15 years, that connecting some heroic brain to a machine should really be a no-brainer. Remember the Matrix? Neo gets a few scary-looking plugs shoved directly into the neat sockets of his brain. And then, from the comfort of his chair, from a hovercraft, he can navigate a complex environment of a matrix using nothing but his mind. And if you thought that that was not hard enough, just imagine that broadband Wi-Fi receiver on that hovercraft to transport his entire brain into the matrix. But most recently, the avatar. Jake Sully gets cocooned into an MRI-looking tube. And then, from the comfort of that tube, using nothing but his mind, again, he can pilot an avatar, 10-foot-tall blue humanoid that inhibits wild alien jungle, which also somehow has broadband Wi-Fi. <laughs> so basically, over and over, science fiction relies on being able to connect some heroic brain to a machine in order to think and thus to act. But that's science fiction. Here is science fact. Forget about wiring the entire brain. We cannot even wire an arm to an amputee. But what do I really mean? We have seen those beautiful arms. Some of you might even have them, all the degrees of freedom, the articulated fingers. But guess what? Those fingers can't feel. An amputee equipped with this arm cannot feel a strong handshake. Neither can they feel a difference between a soft, fuzzy peach or a smooth, fragile egg. You think it's a hard problem. You don't look surprised. You should be. Think about our electronics. Transistors in your iPhone are about one five thousandth of a hair. Neurons in your brain are about one fifth. Transistor can do billions of operations per second. A neuron can do only about a hundred. So how come we cannot connect something so small and so fast as a transistor to something so big and so slow as a neuron. Here's a catch. A transistor is, has three connections. A neuron can support over 6,000 synapses. As engineers, we are trying to connect to this mess. What you see behind me is a state-of-the-art, commercially available deep brain stimulation implant. If you were a Parkinson's patient that stopped responding to medication, this is what you would get. As you are sitting completely awake, a doctor will drill two holes in your skull through which they will feed millimeter thick, three inch long wires directly into your head. Through those wires, we will apply voltages between 1 and 10 volts, which is about 100 times more than what's used by your neurons for communication. And that's the therapy. And even with this technology that looks rather crude and actually dates to 1800s, we have pretty promising results. In fact, you may know that deep brain stimulation can relieve some of the Parkinson's patients, restore motor control, reduce tremors. The question is, at what cost? At the same time, the same stimulation can change someone's personality from a workaholic to a slacker, turn them into an unstoppable gambler, a very common side effect, by the way. It can give people an uncurable depression. Well, those side effects should not be so surprising, because if what you see behind me were the neurons and the connections between them, then the size of a deep brain stimulation implant should be the size of this room. The size of the room. <laughs> so basically, trying to use this device to interact with those individual cells will be akin to trying to play Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto with fingers the size of a pickup truck. So you say that the resolution is not high enough and the device is too big. But hey, 
as engineers, we are really great at making things small. We have reduced the computer from the size of a building to the size of a pocket. So how come the strategies that worked so well for us for miniaturizing and scaling silicon-based electronic circuits do not work for us to connect to neural circuits? OK, let's take a look. This is a silicon wafer. This is what's inside your iPhone. This is the, what all the modern electronics are, ba are based on. It's hard, it's brittle, it's sharp, it's very flat, it's smooth. It is really good for one thing, carrying currents and supporting voltages. Here is your brain. Put, put your two fists together. This is about the size of your brain. And its surface is really three-dimensional and developed. And on the inside, it's soft like a pudding. In fact, you can scoop it with a spoon. <laughs> and within that soft pudding, there are billions of cells, not just neurons, that are constantly interacting with each other electrically, but also exchanging chemicals, also wiggling and pulling constantly. Brain is nothing like a silicon wafer. And if you think that's not enough, think about your arms and legs and the nerves inside them, or your spinal cord. Imagine what happens to them, what strains they experience every time you get into a downward dog in a yoga class. <laughs> or simply get out of bed. So basically, those squishy environments are nothing like silicon wafer. And in order for us to connect to them, we would need new materials. The, these materials need to be able to be more squishy. They need to be able to match this mechanical complexity of neural circuits. But at the same time, they should be able to interact with the brain across all of its languages, not just electrical, but also chemical and also mechanical. How can we do this? How can we build such a device? I'll show you a prototype of a structure that does exactly that. What you're going to see next is a movie recorded with a device that can interact with the brain electrically. It records neural signals, neural voltages. Those are the black spikes that you see. It can supply a stimulus optically as the pulses of blue laser that you see on the screen. And it can infuse chemicals. You will see them as a pink rectangle. What you're going to see is neural activity triggered by those pulses, and then this neural activity is going to change. In fact, it's going to decrease in response to a chemical infused through the same structure. So you see the activity. This is the chemical, and the activity decreases. The reason why it decreases is because the chemical is an inhibitor. And then, when the brain naturally washes out this chemical, the activity comes back. And this is all done with the same structure. So we interacted with the brain across multiple modalities. We have interacted electrically. We have interacted chemically. What about mechanics? How do you think this device looks? Take a look at one of your hairs. Pick one up. The device that allowed us to interact with the brain across those modalities looks just like one of your hairs and feels just like one of your hairs. Imagine that at the tip of your hair, there are electrodes to record neural signals. There is a light guide to supply stimulation. And there are microscopic channels to infuse chemicals. What is this device? Of course, it's not a hair. It's a fiber. Many of you might be familiar with optical fibers that go underneath the Atlantic and Pacific. Those are glass cables that allow you to exchange information with your best friends in London and Tokyo. Our devices are made very similarly, except they're not glass. They're composed of many different materials. And those materials have different functionalities that allow us to speak languages of the brain. Really, this device feels like a hair, 
but does it actually match the mechanics of the brain? Does it leave a mark on the nervous, uh, t on the nervous system? What you see behind me is the brain slice. The d bright dots are nuclei of cells. And what you see that there are a few holes inside that brain slice. One of them is left by our device, but others were there naturally. What are they? They're blood vessels. They're holes left by blood vessels that carry nutrients and oxygen to the brain. And it looks like we are tricking the brain into thinking that our device is a blood vessel and thus reducing its response. So maybe as we are learning from biology to design the devices after the blueprints of the brain or after the blueprints of the blood vessels, maybe we can start hacking the brain without it ever noticing that it's being hacked. But whom am, am I kidding? Let's don't get ahead of ourselves. Which ones of you are ready to get this device implanted into your head? Oh. You should meet me after this, and um, I have a few forms for you to sign, and we are taking the T right back to my lab. Those of you who are not, I don't blame you, because no matter how small, how multifunctional, how soft, and how flexible I make the device, we still have to implant it. We still have to drill holes in your brain. We still have to have wires and tethers. So ultimately, what's better than the minimally invasive neural interface is the interface that's non-invasive at all. Can we come up with the way to interact with the brain wirelessly? and completely remotely. How can we do that? We'll have to look deeper into the brain, into the way it functions. Ultimately, what we are trying to do is to control voltages on neurons. And those voltages are controlled by concentrations of ions inside and outside of neurons. If we learn to control those concentrations of ions, we can control the brain. How can we do it? Well, let's imagine a neuron as a building. This building has walls. That's a neuronal membrane. Inside those walls, there are doors. Those are ion channels. They allow for ions to go in and out, for people to go in and out. One way for us to get into that building is to have the right key to the right door. The other way to get into a building is to pull a fire alarm. That would open fire escape doors, and then ions and people can move in and out. And this is exactly what I'm proposing to do. And the, those fire escape doors are the familiar ones. Imagine eating a habanero. That familiar sensation of burning pain on your tongue is precisely the same if you were to place your tongue directly on the stove. <laughs> and the reason for it is because the iron channel inside the receptors on your tongue that responds to capsaicin, which is the hot spice of a habanera, is exactly the same iron channel that responds to heat. And this iron channel is not only present in your tongue, or it's also present in the neurons in your brain, or across the entire nervous system. So basically, what I'm proposing to do to control the brain is to heat it up. We don't want that, that's fever. What we do want is to control specific groups of cells when we want them, and uh, to do whatever we need them to do. How can we do that? How can we deliver that heat stimulus where we need it deep in the brain? Remotely and wirelessly. It turns out we humans are really transparent to magnetic fields. In fact, the fields with frequencies of hundreds of kilohertz and low amplitudes, we don't feel them at all. 
Why am I telling you this? Because we can synthesize magnetic nanoparticles. Those are essentially speckles of magnetic dust, about one five thousandth of your hair. And they can be dissolved in water and form a fluid that looks just like an espresso. But when we place them in a magnetic field that's variable, these particles undergo a process called hysteresis. We can think about it as a magnetic analog of friction. And through that process, they heat up. So now, imagine we can inject this espresso-looking fluid of particles into the brain and then apply the field to the entire subject entire subject, and only the groups of neurons that are surrounded by the particles will experience the heat and become activated, while everything else will stay intact. Sounds hard, right? Let me show you a movie. What you're going to see is neurons flashing in response to a magnetic field stimulus. In this picture, those flashes mean activity mean firing action potentials. There will be no wires and no tethers. We have a quiet group of cells until the stimulus comes on. And now they start to respond to the stimulus. No wires, no tethers, no brain sockets, no tissue damage. Completely remote stimulation of a precise group of neurons. So maybe as we are starting to learn how to harness those natural fire escape mechanisms of our neurons, we can start to learn how to interface with the brain wirelessly and remotely. And maybe one day some heroic mind can pilot an avatar from the comfort of their tube. <laughs> but how soon can we get there? As a field of brain-machine interfaces, we spent about 20 years. And in these 20 years, our machine has gone from Intel 486, you remember, right? To iPhone 6. While our interface from that machine to the brain stayed practically unchanged. Our desire to reduce the brain to the simplicity of silicon wafer is leading us in circles of tissue damage, side effects, and missed opportunities. So what can we do? What should we do? When can we start potentially reconnecting the spinal cords of paralyzed patients or reattaching the limbs to amputees that s such that they can feel again or treating Parkinson's and depression? Well, as citizens, we can encourage our regulatory bodies to speed up the approval of new technologies, obviously without sacrificing the safety. As patients, we could sign up for clinical trials that involve new technologies. But as engineers, we can embrace the complexity of the brain. And maybe one day we can play the piano of the nervous system without even ever touching its keys. <laughs>